Chapter 5. Flora. Two months later, Flora took a sip of her beer, waiting with Esper and Palma for the announcement of this year's championship runners, those who would compete to be crowned one of the three Hope Runners. Flora knew she would not be one of them. Since Armin's funeral, Flora kept her questions to herself. She had not found another job. In the weeks that passed, the city collected a record amount of Hope Runner applications. She came very close to being one of them. A few times she walked past the Hope Runner's office at the Great Roundabout, just to see what it would feel like. To be considered, you had to fill out an online form and then submit your biometrics at the office. She had already filled in her form a few days after the funeral. She just needed to hit send and walk in. One afternoon after a job interview, she meandered her way there again. Her heart beat in her chest, others rushing past her to submit their biometrics. She closed her eyes for a moment and sensed the city's energy. People walking past her to enter, to leave, creating static not just on her skin, but also with her emotions. She put one foot in front of the other. Nothing felt wrong, so she took another step. The static of the city's energy suddenly turned into a lightning bolt as a man on her right bumped into her, sending Flora's phone careening into a puddle of heck knows what water. It splashed her to her senses. She quickly picked it up and, fearing the worst, ran home to dry it. She never went back. She took another sip of her beer. Screw it, I'll get the next round too, Esper said with what looked like the biggest smile Flora had seen on him since he was a teenager. For half his life, Esper prepared for such a volatile event in the public car markets. He got up and walked to the faux rusted counter. Bacchus, the bar, was in the mid-levels, the concrete organism that was growing over the cars throughout the city. A few years ago, car owners were only permitted to erect temporary structures around their cars. For privacy, some erected temporary walls. In case the gridlock had to move, others erected poles on the side, creating tree fort-like homes and businesses on top. When a car was sold, all the structures had to be removed. As more people unexpectedly lived and worked in the cars, it became increasingly difficult to police it. And thus, temporary structures eventually gave way to permanent structures. Legal battles ensued, but the city eventually gave up and passed new legislation due to the additional structures increasing the value of the cars underneath them and in turn, generating more tax revenue. The mid-levels, the structures above the cars, whether the car remained open or closed was eventually formalized. If you owned a car in the gridlock, you owned everything above it. Real estate collectives started buying up blocks of cars in order to build new skyscrapers in between the old existing skyscrapers. Each car underneath a mid-levels building was an always-on-sale share for whatever revenue was being generated above it. Below Bacchus was such a bunch of cars that collected revenue from the expensive beers that Esper bought. Inside Bacchus were techies, artists, and gentrification nomads. It wasn't penthouses folk, and it wasn't trunks folk either. The bar itself shared a similar aesthetic, worn down foundations with expansive furnishings. It was a great middle ground for Flora, Palma, and Esper to meet. So hang on. Please break it down for me again. What was your strategy? Palma asked. Esper answered. So this was the hypothesis, right? Set up the following trades after a hope run. You buy cars at the edges of the city, sell the cars in the middle of the city. If a hope runner comes back, what will people do, do you think? It happened exactly like I hoped. Filled with hope after Armin came back, people bought the cars on the edges of the city wanting to leave, and sold their cars in the dead areas. So I made money from selling the edges and now bought Trunks cars in the center of the city for cheap, Esper said as he winked from under his cap. That's crazy, Palma said, taking a sip of his beer. No one else did this? Oh, of course, but knowing when to enact this strategy is important. That's where you need machine learning. Amazing, Palma turned to Flora. Maybe you should work for Esper, he said laughing. Flora rolled her eyes. The TVs in Bacchus, flat, wide screens with ancient frames that used to be found on black and white TVs, switched over to the mayor. Palma hollered. On the same podium the mayor spoke a few months ago for Armin's funeral, 
she was now announcing the next set of hopefuls that would become the city's new champions. Next to her sat a few distinguished city officials surrounded by a ring of championship mechs. Citizens, we are all excited. Extraordinary times call for extraordinary measures, and thus, an extraordinary championship. Instead of one hope runner, the city will send three hope runners. Instead of three trials, we will only have two. We've seen immense demand and share equally in the hope you all have. To accommodate the amount of applications, we've gathered a larger citizens' assembly than usual to more quickly choose the 10 competitors. Our city's advanced cryptographic random number generator dutifully picked many of you to sit on the championship assembly. Thank you to all the citizens that stood to be selected. Your work in sifting through the applications helps keep our hope alive. We've also tasked our city's incredibly capable scientists to ensure that our newly proposed long-distance hope mechs are exactly what we need to understand what happened to Armin. Thank you to the chief scientist of our Mech Institute, Tinu Emmer, the mayor said as she pointed to him. A tall, broad man with tiny round glasses and wavy black hair stood on the podium on the great roundabout and waved to the city. Go, Dad! Palma shouted in the bar, almost spilling his beer. Flora was still despondent, but Palma's excitement rubbed off on her. Before we continue, I want to use this opportunity to express another issue of concern you've all had. We hear you. The aftermath of Armin's return has caused rightful discontent with our beloved gridlock. We know that there was confusion that the tax rates in the public car market could be increased to cover the costs of this championship. We would like to inform the city that at this stage, it will not be happening. Not until we've done proper consultation. For now, we've funded the championship from budget reallocations. You can rest assured that for now, the tax rates won't change and that you will not have to update your always-on-sale prices of your cars. Our Parliament will soon inform you all, with ample time, what is next. More cheers echoed through the city. Hope is waiting for us. So without further ado, here are your 10 championship runners for this year's trials. The patrons and Bacchus quieted. First up, Darius Cantor. His tribute and beneficiary of his winnings, should he win is his wife, Prairie Cantor. The mayor's voice boomed. A middle-aged man with a mohawk came on the screen. The city clapped and roared, but the patrons and Bacchus didn't seem like they wanted to show much excitement. They were interested, but they didn't want to show that they were super interested. Number two, Argent Winslow. Her selected tribute is her daughter, Piper Winslow. Audible gasps went up, the city itself taking a deep breath. Cheers soon followed. Flora felt a pang of shock. She wanted to be on the screen as well. This time round, she could see Argent's tattoos more clearly. They were parallel black lines that ran from her eyes into her hair. Number three, Sonny Augustus. His tribute is his daughter, Allie Augustus. A middle-aged man with a firm jaw and a scar across his face appeared on the screen. The man's smile seemed familiar to Flora but before she could figure it out, the mayor continued. Number four, Richter Allen. His tribute is his brother, Trim Allen. A slender man appeared on the screen. Number five, Sitello Immer. His tribute is his father, Pren Immer. A young muscular man with a bald head appeared on the screen. Palma paused for a moment. He rubbed his eyes and they widened as the news sunk in. That's him, that's my cousin. He shouted, almost spilling his beer. The entire bar turned his way, annoyed that someone was being interested. For Flora, however, all the eyes on them took her back to their old apartment when she watched the candidate announcements 18 years ago. The family and the neighbors were there, wondering if her father would get selected to compete. She was young and had no clue what was happening. So all she could do was celebrate with them when River's name and face appeared on the screen. Palma turned to Flora and cracked a smile. Number six, Mickey Rue. Her tribute is her partner, Pharaoh Rue. A young woman with a glowing smile appeared on the screen. Number seven, Buck Chassis. His tribute is his son, Gerard Chassis. A burly man appeared on the screen. All throughout these announcements, cheers echoed through the city. 
quite an interesting selection this year. Besides Argent and my cousin, I haven't heard of any. Palma asked. Flora and Esper didn't answer. Number eight, Omo Nira. Her tribute is her mother, Hila Nira. A muscled woman brimming with confidence appeared on the screen. We're almost finished. Number nine, Cassidy Kim. A slim young woman with long black hair appeared on the screen. Oh, I know her, Palma said. She was a popular social media influencer. What followed would change Flora's life forever. Lastly, number 10, Flora Kaigo. Her tribute is her mother, Madeira Kaigo. On the monitor was Flora's own face staring back at her. The keys were dangling from her ears, peeking out from her shoulder-length hair. Flora lurched like a car failing to properly switch gears. Palma stopped in his tracks. Esper's eyes lit up. Cheers went up in the distance as the mayor concluded the announcements. The first trial is in two months. Thank you, citizens of Gridlock. Here's to hope. May the best runners win. The barman turned the music back on and the voices of the other clientele rose around Flora, Palma, and Esper. Flora? Palma asked as he defrosted from the stunned silence. It wasn't me, she answered. It wasn't me, I didn't enter. Palma's eyes widened. He turned to Esper. Did... Did you... What's going on? Palma? Esper? What did you do? Esper couldn't stop a smile from slowly forming on his face. Holy shit, it actually worked. His face soon turned back to serious. Palma collapsed back into his chair, holding onto the table with both hands, stealing himself. What worked? Flora asked. What did you do? Palma started sweating as he furrowed his brow. Listen, uh... Esper interjected. I did it. I got you what you always wanted. What do you mean? No, what the hell? If I wanted to enter, I would have. What happened? How did you even do it? Palma started answering the question, hoping Esper would fill in. Look, I wanted to help. Like you always said, you want to run. Last year, after Armin's Hope Run, Esper and I went for some drinks and... Esper continued... And Palma saw a job in the trunks that would reward anyone for being able to forge a Hope Runner application. I remember you always wanted this, and I saw it as a challenge. Now we all win. Screw it, I'll order a round for everyone in this bar. What the hell? No, you entered me without asking me? Who gave you that right? Still the same Esper you've always been. Esper replied, Relax, I didn't even think it would work. You know how hard it was to forge that biometric signature? I don't even want to know, Flora answered. Blood started draining from her face. She felt weak. The noise from the bar suddenly felt like the cars being swallowed by the concrete, suffocating. She slowly got up and walked to the exit. The door into Bacchus peered over the cars in the gridlock down below, a precipice. Wait, Esper shouted. What? He hid under his cap. Wait, are you serious? Didn't you want this? She did want it. Esper was right. As teenagers, they would spend hours sitting on computers reading conspiracies about the anomaly. To run would be to find those answers. Flora had tears in her eyes, but she pushed them away to avoid giving in to Esper and Palma. I do, but screw you if you think it's okay to do that. You've always been the same, still that selfish, controlling dick. Nothing's changed. You hacked my VR simulator because I want to win. You faked my resumes to get me a job because I want it. How many times must I tell you to stop doing this shit? Flora shouted. She took a deep breath before she gathered more of what she wanted to say. And I can't. I have to take care of my mother. You knew that too, but still you went ahead for a challenge. The tribute money, Flora. She will have all she needs now and finally get back to having an apartment again, not living in the gridlock anymore. Flora felt the blood that drained flow back to her heart. She clenched her fist, feeling both anger and guilt. I know she needs it, and please don't tell me this again. I know it was my fault she lost the money. Esper, I know it might be hard for you to understand. Money isn't everything, okay? I can't do this. I have to cancel my candidacy. 
her mind raced putting together the second order effects of such a stunt. Do you know how hard it will be to get a new job now? In front of the entire city, the most important championship. I'll be seen as a coward. Flora shook her head, turned around, and leapt down the stairs of the mid-levels into the open streets below. In the twilight, Flora's hands and arms formed a makeshift shield against anyone who would witness her as she traipsed through the litter, a reminder of the city's priorities. The city felt more like itself than ever before. Faces were blurring past in the darkness. The skyscrapers were humanity's tombstones, waiting for its inhabitants to become corpses. The gridlock was society's arteries ossified in rigor mortis. Hope drained into dark tunnels beneath the city. Her mind was like her scrambling feet, crisscrossing through options that would calm her mother down when she got back home. She voiced it in her head. Mom, I'm not lying. I didn't enter myself. Mom, please calm down. I'm not going to leave you. Mom, I promise I won't see Esper again. Mom, how can I make up for this mess? Before their bus, she straightened herself, took a deep breath, and stepped through the driver's door of their home. Without hesitation, she preempted whatever volley of anger would be thrown her way. Mom, I can explain this. When she looked up, however, she saw her mom, calmly sitting at the kitchen table holding a thick book. Madeira looked up confused. Explain what, my dear? Madeira said in a calm voice. The Hope Runner announcements, Mom, didn't you see? I did, love. And? I have something for you. Flora released her emotional breaks. Mom, I don't understand. Aren't you angry? Madeira looked down at the book in front of her and started trembling through a tear. I was angry, and I was confused. You never told me you were entering. But then I realized... Madeira swallowed some of her emotions. I realized that's exactly what River did. I've always been angry and confused about him leaving. But the years have eroded away those emotions, only to leave me with my shame. I'm ashamed that I didn't support him when he needed me. I was confused and believed he was lying. Why would we need protection? Protection from what? And when he didn't want to tell us, my mind raced into all manner of dark alleys. That perhaps he led a life I never knew about. Mom, why didn't you tell me this is how you felt? I always felt so ashamed of what I did not being there for him. Flora tried to find more answers in the silence that followed. This time around, I will support you, she said with a firm head nod. You had to keep your entry from me, and so I already know that I haven't learned from what I did to River. This is my time. In the past, I wasn't the best partner, and now I wasn't being the best mother. I'm sorry. Flora's heart did several jumps as both hope and terror fueled it. Hope that she was finally being given the opportunity to answer her questions. But for the same reason, there was terror. Terror in realizing that she might finally be closer to having the answers. Mom! It was all Flora could muster. Madeira took it as an invitation to continue explaining. I've sat with so much resentment in my life. At my age, I'm half past to death. Please forgive me so I can support you. I want to support you, please. Madeira said as she moved her eyes to the book in front of her. I have something for you. It was your father's. She pushed the book forward to her daughter, but held it back before Flora could take it. Promise me that during your training for the championship, that you will take care of it. Flora frowned, nodded, and took it with trembling hands. She blew some dust off. It read... Mech Maneuvers, Volume 1. Despite her confusion, a smile formed on her face as she slowly opened a new chapter, seeing her father's old handwritten notes inside of it. One of them caught her eye. It read, When you are worried, when you are confused, when you are unsure, you shouldn't fight it. Each time, it is an opportunity. Live with the hesitation. Be one with it. Her hands slowly moved over the pages, she looked up at her mother and through a teary smile came over to hug her. Dear, you don't have to explain anything. For now. I will be here for you. Flora looked back down at the book and wondered whether she should tell the truth to her mother. 
She didn't choose to enter. Her friends did it for her. But now she could find answers and her mother supported her. This felt good. It felt right. She closed her eyes briefly and took a step forward in her mind. In the distance, a car alarm went off and what was usually background noise now felt like a lullaby. She opened her eyes again and looked at the manual. Soon, she could be a few steps closer to seeing him and knowing the truth, what her father protected them from and what had happened to him. Despite being angry at her friends, the desire to find answer overshadowed everything else. She embraced her mother as the skyscrapers smiled down upon them. Flora wanted to tell her. Madeira had done so much for her. For now, however, Flora would keep the truth to herself.